Hello, friends and brothers. Today, Poesia Reformada Publications presents More Than Conquerors by Will William Hendrickson. Chapter 1, we introduce the book of Revelation. It says, Beautiful, beyond description, is the last book of the Bible. Beautiful in in symbolism, in purpose, and in meaning. Where in literature do we find anything that excels the majestic description of the Son of Man walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands? Revelation chapter 1, 12 through 20. Where in scripture do we find a more vivid and picturesque portrayal of the Christ, faithful and true, going forth and to victory? seated upon a white horse, a ride with garment sprinkled with blood, followed by the armies of heaven. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 16, where again we find sharper contrast than that between the doom of Babylon on the one hand, and the felicity of Jerusalem, the golden on the other. Revelation chapter 18, 19, 21, 22. And where are the thrones set in heaven and the blessedness of heavenly life depicted in a manner more certainly simple, yet beautiful in its very simplicity? Revelation 4, 2, 5, verse 14, chapter 7, verses 13 through 17. What a wealth of comfort, what an insight into the future. Above, above all, what an unveiling of the love of God is contained in the words of the prophecy of this book. What is the purpose of this book? Persecuted believer, this book of Revelation seeks to impart comfort to you. That is its main purpose, to comfort the will militant church in its struggle against the forces of evil. It abounds with consolation for afflicted believers, and to them is given the assurance God see their tears, chapter 7, verse 17, chapter 21, verse 4, their prayers rule the world, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Their death is precious in his sight, and their soul immediately ascends to heaven, a heaven whose glory far surpasses the intensity of early suffering. Chapter 14, verse 13. Chapter 20, verse 4. Their final victory is assured. Chapter 15, verse 2. Their blood will be avenged. Chapter 6, verse 9. Chapter and chapter 8, verse 3. Their Christ lives and reigns forever and forever. It is he who governs the world in the interest of, of his church. Chapter 5, verse 7. He's coming again to take his people unto himself in, quote, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and to live with them forever and rejuvenated universe. Chapters 21st and 22nd. Thinking of that glorious hope, that second coming, our hearts begin to throb with joy, our souls are consumed with journeying, with breathless impatience, our eyes attempt to burst the dark, tremendous sea of clouds, hoping that the glorious descent of the sand of man may burst upon the view. It is a longing which gushes unto words, quote, and the spirits and the bride say, Come, and he that, that hears, let him say, Come. Finish quote. But what do we do, my eyes behold? 
already he is with me, with me in the spirit. Walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands, chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. Quote, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, and I am alive for evermore, and I have the keys of dead and Hades. More than conquerors are we through him that loved us. We ask, what is the theme of this book? We answer, the theme of this book is the victory of Christ and of his church over the dragon, Satan, and his helpers. The apocalypse intends to show you, dear believer, that things are not what they seem. The beast that comes up out of the Abba seems to be glorious. He, quote, makes war with them, overcomes them, and kills them. And their, and their dead bodies lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And from among the peoples, and tribes and tongues and nations do men long upon their dead bodies three days and a half, and suffer now their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb, and they that dwell on the air rejoice over them, and make merry, and they send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the air. But this rejoicing is premature. In reality, it is that the liver who dreams. We are read, quote, and after the three days and a half, the breath of life from God entered into them, and they stood off their feet, and great fear fell upon them that beheld them. That dominion over the world became the dominion of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, ends quote. Throughout the prophecies of this wonderful book of the Christ is ever pictured as the victor, the conqueror, chapter 1, 18, 2a, 5, 9, chapter 6, verse 2, 11, verse 15, 12, verse 9, 14, verse 1, chapter 14, chapter 15, verse 2, and so on. He conquers dead, he is the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, the men who worship the beast, etc. His victorious hands, so are we, even when we seem to be hopeless, defeated. Do you see that band of believers? We asked, we answer. Are their garments splashed and filthy? They wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Chapter 7, verse 14, 22, verse 14. And they, in the great tribulation, are they in the great tribulation, we ask? They come out of it. Chapter 7, verse 14. Are they killed, we ask? They stand upon their feet. Chapter 11, verse 11. Or are they persecuted by the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? In the end, you see them standing victoriously among Zion. Ra rather, you see the Lamb, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads, foreheads Chapter 14, verse 1, they jump over the beast. Chapter 15, verse 2, does it seem as if their prayers are not heard? heard? Chapter 6, verse 10, the judgments sent upon the earth are, are God's un answer to their prayers. Chapter 8, verses 3 to 5. Why are these prayers constitute the real key that will unlock the mysteries of any sound philosophy of history? Do they seem to be defeated? 
In reality, they rain. Yes, they rain upon the earth. Chapter 5, verse 10. In heaven with Christ. A thousand years. Chapter 20, verse 4. In the new heaven and the earth forever and ever. Chapter 22, verse 5. And what happens to those who seem to be conquerors? I see them arise out of the abyss, the sea, the air. Yes, I see them, the dragon. Chapter 12, verse 3, the beast. Chapter 13, verse 1, the false prophet. Chapter 13, verse 11, and Babylon. 14, verse 8, in that order. And then... I see them go down in defeat. Babylon 18 verse 2 and the beast and the false prophet chapter 19 verse 20 and the dragon 2010 in that exactly reverse order. Again, do you wish to know the theme of this book? Let the book speak up for its for itself. Is the theme is stated most gloriously and completely in verse chapter 17 verse 14 quote these shall war against the lamb and the lamb shall conquer them for he is the lord of lords and king of kings and they also shall conquer what they are with him called and chosen and faithful and quote for whom was this book intended we ask on my desk lies a recently published commentary on the apocalypse. It's a very interesting book. It views the apocalypse as a kind of history written beforehand. It discovers in the last book of Bible copies and detailed reference to Napoleon Wars in the, in the Balkans, the Great European War of 1914, through 1918, the German ex-emperor Wilhelm, Hitler, and Mussolini, the NRA, etc., or Berwick, Sash and Kindred's explanation, but the other ones be dismissed. Page 257. Tell me, dear reader, what good would the suffering and severely persecuted Christian of John's day have? derived from a specific and detailed prediction concerning European condition, which, which would prevail some 2,000 years later. A sound interpretation of the apocalypse must take as its start, starting point the position that the book was intended for believers living in John's day and age. The book owes its origin, at least in part, to contemporary conditions. It is God's answer to the prayers and tears of severely persecuted Christians scattered about in the, in the cities of Asia Minor. Nevertheless, although it, it is true that we must take our starting point in the age in which John lived, and must even emphasize the fact that that the condition which actually prevailed during the last decade of the first century AD furnish the immediate occasion for this prophecy, which should give equal prominence to the fact that this book was intended not only for those who first read it, but for all believers throughout the entire dispensation. We submit the following arguments for this position. First, the affliction to which the church was subjected in the days of the Apostle John is typically of the persecution which true believers must endure throughout the entire dispensation. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse and especially just before Christ's second coming, Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 and 30. Secondly, many of the predictions in which the book abounds concern, concern principles and happenings which are so broad in their scope that they cannot be confined to one 
definite year of century. The seals, the trumpets, bowls span the centuries, reaching out to the great consummation. Thirdly, the, the epistles, chapter 12 and 3, are addressed to the seven churches. Seven is the number which symbolizes completeness. It clearly indicates that admonitions and consolation of this book were meant for the entire church throughout the centuries. Finally, all those who read and studied this book in any age are called blessed. Chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, as at the beginning, so also at the close of the book, the author addresses himself not merely to one group of men living in one decade, but to, quote, even men that heard the word of the prophecy of this book. Who wrote this book? The author tells us what his name is, that his name is John. Chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 4, chapter 9, 22, verse 8. The question is, who is John? The apostle or another? Some deny that John, the beloved disciple, brought the apocalypse. You see? The author of the four gospel and of the three love epistles never mentioned his own name, but the author of the apocalypse tells us what his name that his name is John. Again, it is pointed out that there is a striking difference between the style and general tone of the gospel and epistles, and on the other hand, and revelation on the other. Just sit down and read and read the Gospel of John. When you finish read the apocalypse, did you notice the difference? In the format, the ideas flow smoothly. In the latter, they are introduced abruptly. You never know what the author is going to talk about next. The former emphasizes God's love. The later, so they tell me, stresses his stern justice. The former describes the inner conditions of the heart. The latter dwells on the external course of events. The former is written in a beautiful idiomatic Greek. The latter is Latter is great, written in well, what they, what do they call it? Rock characteristic barbaros Greek. Then they tell me there is there is a marked difference between the doctrine of the gospel and of the park claims. Former is broad-minded, universalistic. It it preaches the Whosoever evangel and salvation by grace, the latter, so they tell me, is narrow-minded, particularly stick. It is Jewish in its doctrine of salvation, and it stresses the necessity of good works. Finally, long ago, around the year, 250 AD, there, there lived a man whose name was Dionysius of Alexandria, and this great and pious man ascribed the book of Revelation to, quote, another John, page 257. Now, are they still sure that John the Apostle wrote the Apocalypse? Some are convinced by the ways of these arguments that some other John, there are so many Johns, you know, brought the apocalypse, page 257. They still believe that John the Apostle was responsible for the fourth gospel. Others take it just the other way. 
to accept the Johannine via Johann authorship of the Pangolins to claim that some other person, maybe another John, maybe not even a John, wrote the Gospel, page 257. And of course, there are the radicals who deny that the Apostle John wrote either the Gospel or the Apocalypse. Let's examine the arguments for a moment. The first one is rather weak. Don't you think so? I would say. The very fact that the author of the Apocalypse merely calls himself John indicates that he was very well known, not only in one particular locality, but throughout the churches of Asia. By simply calling himself John, without any additional designation, everybody immediately knew just who was meant. That does not the conclusion seem warranted that this person who was so well known must have been the Apostle John? Suppose the author of the book, book which you are now reading would simply call and say, William, do you think for a minute that everybody would immediately guess who wrote it? were thoroughly convinced that there was only one John who did not need to add the Apostle for the very reason that he was the Apostle. Besides, the author does not come to saw the Apostle for the simple reason that he wrote this book in the capacity of Sir, to whom visions were revealed. The difference in grammar, in style, and general tone must be admitted. But does this man mean that John the Apostle cannot have written the Apocalypse? In our opinion, it does not. How then shall we account this difference? Some there are, some there are who hold that when John wrote the Gospel, he had assistance. Perhaps the elders on Ephesus, John. Chapter 21st, verse 24. While the absence of their assistant when John was in Patmos would account for the peculiar grammar and style characteristics of the Apocalypse. Other elements may enter into the explanation. Let us begin the emphasizing by emphasizing the fact that we shall not exaggerate this difference in style and language. There is also a strong body lessons between the Gospel and the Apocalypse. Of late, many are beginning to, to emphasize this fact. There are striking similarities, similarities even in peculiar grammatical construction, also in characteristic expressions. Again, as for the style, should we expect to find the same style in a history of events, the Gospel, a person later, the ep Epistles and the Apocalypse of or unveiling Revelation. In this very connection, let us not forget that when John wrote the last book of the Bible, his soul was in such a condition of deep inner emotion, surprise, and ecstasy. He was put in the spirit. Remember that this early Jewish training may have exerted itself more forcibly and may even have influenced his style and language. We feel certain that the presented nature of the subject matter, the deeply emotional state of the author, when he received and wrote these visions, and the fact that John in this book makes abundant use of the Old Testament, Hebrew and Greek, account to a large extent for the difference in style which remain after the striking similarities have been deducted. We need not dwell at length on the so-called difference in doctrinal emphasis. The simple fact is that the four gospel and the apocalypse do not clash on even in a single point. In fact, the agreement in doctrine is remarkable. Does the gospel call Jesus the Lamb of God? John 1, 29, 
so does the apocalypse 29 times do the epistles and the gospel use the title the logos which reference to our lord john chapter 1 verse 1 first john chapter 1 verse 1 so does the apocalypse chapter 19 verse 13 does the gospel represent Christ as the free temporal eternal being? Chapter 1, verse 1. So that's the Apocalypse. Chapter 22, verse 13. 5, verse 12. Verse 13. Does the gospel of Job John ascribe man's salvation to the sovereign grace of God and to the blood of Jesus Christ? Chapter 1, verse 29. 3, 3. Chapter 5, verse 24. 10, verse 10. Chapter 11, so and very emphatically does the Apocalypse. Chapter 7, verse 14, 12, verse 11, 21st, verse 6, 22nd, verse 17. And the whosoever doctrine is found in both John 3, 16, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, 22, verse 17. There are no doctrine differences. Finally, the opinion of Dionysius adopted by Eusebius. But it should be clear that this view rests upon a misreading of a very careful statement of a certain Papias, and was probably influenced by opposition to Kiliasm, which sought to justify itself by an appeal to the Book of Revelation. The early church is well nigh anonymous in ascribing their revelation to the Apostle John. That was the opinion of Justin Martyr, 140 AD, of Irenaeus, 180 AD, who was a disciple of a disciple of the Apostle John, of the Muriturian Canon, 1200 AD, of Clement of Alexandria, 12 AD, of the children of Carthage, 220 AD, of Origin of Alexandria, 223 AD, and Hippolytus, 240 AD. When we add to all this, according to a very strong tradition, the Apostle John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, chapter 1, verse 9, and that he spent the closing years of his life at Ephesus to which the first of the seven epistles of Apocalypse was addressed. Chapter 2, verse 1. The conclusion that the last book of the Bible was written by, quote, the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is inestimable. The question now rises, when did John write the Apocalypse? In the year 69 or even earlier? Or must we reverse the figure that it makes 96 or perhaps 95? We have not found a single really cogent argument in support of the earlier date. The arguments put forth seek the strength in late and shaky testimonies in the wholly imaginary idea that John did not dead know his Greek when he wrote the Apocalypse. In a very questionable literal interpretation of certain passages, which must, must certainly have a symbolical meaning. Thus, for example, we are told that the Temple of Jerusalem was still standing when the Apocalypse was written. For chapter 11, verse 1, reads, Rise and measure the Temple of God. The late date was very strong support, says Irenaeus, for that, namely the Apocalypse vision was not a very long time since, for almost in our own day, towards the end of the nation's reign. Again, he says, quote, the church in Ephesus found by Paul and having John remaining among them permanently until the times of Trajan, year 98, 117 AD, Trajan's reign. This is a true witness of the tradition of the apostles. When, in connection with this strong and definite evidence, we remember that the apocalypse reflects an age in which Ephesus was already lost in its, its first love. Sardis is already dead. Laodicea, which was destroyed 
an earthquake during Nero's range has been rebuilt and is boasting of its spiritual wealth. Chapter 3, verse 17. John has been banished, a very common form of persecution during the mission's reign. The church has already endured persecution in the past. Chapter 20, verse 4. And the Roman Empire, as such, has become the great antagonist of the church. Verse 17, verse 9. When we remember all these facts, we are forced to the conclusion that the late day, 95 or 96 AD, is correct. The Apocalypse was written toward the end of the Venetian's reign by the Apostle John. Yet, the real author is not John, but the Almighty God himself. We read the revelation of Jesus Christ, which, which God gave him, and he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. To be sure, John the Apostle wrote, the revelation but God through Christ was the real author. Hence, what this book predicts, predicts is not the book of human fancy, prone to error, but the revelation of the man and purpose of God concerning the history of the church. At Copenhagen, among the many noble sculptures of Thor Walson, there is one of the Apostle John. His countenance is suffused with the serenity of heaven. He is actually looking up to heaven. His tablet is before him. In his hand is his pen. Observe, however, that the apostle pen does not touch the tablet. He will not venture on a single word until it be given to him from above. And well,